Hey there everybody, it's Ryan from Cataclysm Now, and tonight we're going to be doing a quick review of Clash of Giants Civil War, a design uh, made by Ted Racer and published by GMT Games. It's the third in a um, running series called Clash of Giants. The first two volumes are about the um, First World War operational level. I think the first one was the Marne and Tannenberg, and then um, the second volume is Galicia, and I can't remember what the other one is. But, um, you know, for his designer notes, um, he thought that the system could be applied to two meeting engagements uh, during the Civil War, uh, that being the battles of Bull Run and Gettysburg. <clears throat> now, like that, uh, um, the previous system, or the previous two titles, uh, it's not on the operational scale. These are decidedly uh, battle games. Um, but like uh, Ted always does, um, he puts his own spin to it and uh, basically brings in a couple of elements um, to make it more streamlined. Um, what he effectively, effectively has done is cut out a lot of superfluous systems. Um, he focuses on a handful of primary mechanisms and he ties it all together with um, the chip pull mechanism. Um, it's sublime and it suffice to say he, he's mastered it at this point. Uh, so it is a brigade level game um, and the values on the um, chits represent uh, combat factors with the add to combat and then their um, tactical efficiency rater, rating. So before we actually get too more, uh, into that too much, um, just talk about a general, the, the meat and potatoes of the game are, uh, it's the chip pull by formation. So depending on the battle um, in uh, Gettysburg uh, for the US forces, it's primarily core, and then for the Confederate forces, it's primarily divisions. So they'll pull a chip <clears throat> to see when they can move. But before they can move, um, there's no movement allowance printed on the actual uh, counter. Each formation has their own, um, let's see if I can produce one here, has their own movement allowance chart. Yeah, it's printed on the map for full run, but it's listed on these separate cards here. And depending on um, the uh, result of 1d6, that core will be able, only be able to move um, that many uh, movement points. So for, if for instance on here, you know, the US third core, if they roll a one or a two, they only have four movement points, um, as opposed to a four, five, or six, where they get eight. So this has a lot of variability in terms of um, when you're planning uh, movement of formations and when to attack. Um, and unlike other games where you can move then attack, each side can only initiate combat one time. And then from there, any units that are eligible and adjacent may attack. So that means as you're pulling chits and you're moving your formations in to the places they need to be, if you activate combat too early, then you lack uh, firepower to either turn a flank or destroy units. Uh, but if you wait too long, then you give the enemy the opportunity to interdict your movements or, or launch an attack um, that's favorable to them. So there's this innate tension there um, between, I mean, even solitaire. And usual caveats apply. Didn't play this face-to-face. -face, uh, played um, each scenario multiple times. And I've played it before in the past. Just got into it a little more recently because my uh, Civil War mania. But there's that tension there that really kind of livens up the, um, the decision space. Where you really want that extra core to participate, but if you wait any longer, um, the, the enemy could draw their core and then, and then move uh, against you. Now there are special command um, chits that are in play outside of um, the normal bucket that you're pulling from, and those are battle contingent and also turn conting contingent. But by and large, the system is pulling chits, moving, declaring combat or not declaring combat, and engaging from there. Now, once combat actually takes place, um, 
the, there is a combat results table, but they really just provide modifiers. So in a standard one-to-one, -one, there are no modifiers, but what you will do is, instead of consulting a chart to see if you know someone was repulsed or someone took a step loss, you go down, uh, starting with the defender, um, each uh, brigade that's involved in that combat uh, has to roll against their tactical efficiency rating, um, henceforth known as TER, which essentially um, it ca captures the morale of the unit. Um, if you equal, if you roll equal to or below, the one's always being a success, uh, unmodified success period, um, then the brigade um, remains in place and doesn't receive any step losses. Um, but if it rolls uh, above or, or a six, which is an automatic failure, no matter what, um, then the step loss is taken and then the brigade has to retreat um, the number of hexes uh, or the difference with their TER. So yeah, if they have TER three and they roll a six, they would take the step loss and have to fall back um, three spaces. So what that, what that allows um, are these stacks of units. So I mean, the stacking is only two per hex and you have to be stacked with the same division. Um, yeah, the same division um, when attacking, but this allows for these bloody contests to happen and which even if a unit uh, defenders are pushed off a hex or a position, the uh, attackers can't don't necessarily advance if they all fail their TERs. So it, instead of going off of one result of a combat results table, you are able to have a wider variety of outcomes where an attack can come in and they can just obliterate all brigades but one that can hold on and they can hold the position um, even with relatively few losses to the attackers. Now, if there are, the, the more you up the odds or you do flank attacks, um, then you can limit the amount of attack uh, attacker brigades that have to check their TER. Usually at a one-to-one, -one, anybody who's involved with combat has to check against that. At first, it's a little counterintuitive because you're so used to rolling against the enemy's numbers, but in this case, you're rolling against your, your, uh, your own, or a unit's own uh, efficiency rating. Um, but I, I thought it worked wonderfully. Um, it did produce semi-historical results. Um, uh, and yeah, we, we, like I said, it was, it was pretty bloody. Um, um, factored into that is um, he's abstracted. There are no individual or artillery units. There's no like, batteries, there's no range combat. Um, his rationale in at least what the designer notes were that artillery wasn't as decisive uh, in the Civil War, so uh, he has um, the availability of the chits and the superiority in terms of who has how many decided at the beginning. Um, it's actually one of the first things you do in the, in the game or during each turn is uh, pulling um, artillery chits, which usually have just a combat uh, factor of one out of the cup um, at a certain number, and then those can be used uh, during eligible uh, combats, because they're usually assigned by core division, core divisional artillery. Um, but so, so that's combat, um, pretty straightforward. Um, the, another element um, that I think adds a lot of spice and variety is the um, variable entry hex and, and potentially delayed um, uh, arrival of reinforcements. So you have a, you know, a core or a division who's slated to arrive on a certain turn. You roll a die to see if it does arrive on time. One through four it does. Uh, and then you roll another die and if it's one through four it comes on its historical entry hex. But anytime it's a five or a six, um, then it can be delayed a couple of turns, um, or it can appear on a road where it didn't nor uh, didn't appear uh, historically. And so this adds a little bit of variety in terms of you can't always count on a particular core arriving at a certain time. Um, and he's balanced that in a way so that if you do have core or, for, or formations that are delayed, then you gain victory points um, 
for essentially fighting uh, more with less. Um, so, so that's another little interesting feature that, that I quite liked. And, and historically, we were playing Gettysburg campaign and uh, Longstreet's division was, um, it was incredibly late. Um, they didn't really get onto the field. Um, basically, it, it delayed what have, could have been historically the, the second day's fighting. Um, on the south, is, uh, south of Gettysburg, that didn't pan out just because um, most of Longstreet's, um, I should say, Longstreet's core, the divisions under Longstreet, didn't show up on time and were delayed. But then we ended up helping them because they were able to send a victory later on because uh, their threshold for breaking was a lot higher because um, those because they got those victory points. So it's another element um, that I really liked about it. Um, and yeah, going back to the victory um, conditions, it's mo it's mostly contingent on um, victory or, or, or casualty um, casualty losses. So every loss you inflict is a point. Um, there are certain core that the Union held back, especially in Gettysburg. I think there's also a core in um, Second Bull Run where if they take step losses, it counts as two victory points. That's because those respective um, formations were held back in reserve. Um, so you don't arbitrarily, so you don't essentially use your, your the 2020 vision of history and commit those core uh, necessarily. Um, Absent a automatic victory being achieved, usually through um, casualties, then geographic hexes uh, and delay um, VPs can come into play. Uh, come into play. They've got actually a really interesting um, setup for the geographic hexes. Each hex, you don't know its value uh, until if you get to the end of the game. At the end of the game, you roll a die and you'll uh, basically a one d three. A D6, but one D3 in um, and halved, um, and that will be the number of points that um, a victory hex is worth. And those are, you know, the usual suspects: um, Seminary Ridge, Cemetery Hill, um, Culps Hill. Oh, we have the Wheat Field, Devil's Den. Um, actually, I don't know if Devil's Den is, but the Wheat Field, and then um, the Round Tops. I like the little, little Round Top. Um, so those exist, so they can, so it doesn't become fighting over specific territory, it just becomes more of a, a broad guideline of maybe you should steer towards this. It also incentivizes um, the Union or the United States to play historically, because I, I, I feel like most players wouldn't replicate Sickles. Um, wandering out uh, out of position into the wheat field, um, knowing that it could have disastrous consequences. But because the Ted Racers put victory hexes out there, you may actually find yourself doing that. So it's a it's a bizarre way to incentivize historical behavior, but um, yeah, I think it works. But um, so yeah, uh, just. Like I said, this would be a quick review on um, Clash of Giants Civil War by Ted Racer and published by GMT Games. Um, it's a swell little game I, I, you can easily play. Um, it's not exactly a real quick game in, in a night, but it, it's digestible. Um, it, it, again, it's the chip pull mechanism and there's just something really organic, um, not just gameplay wise, but, but narratively, especially for solo play. Um, you're not quite sure who's going to go next, and uh, yeah, it's it's one of the reasons why I play war games. Um, is for for that sort of emerging narrative. But yep, I'll keep this one uh, short and sweet. Um, basically, I, I recommend, um, especially uh, Clash of Giants of War, especially because of the solitaire element. If you're looking for a light, um, not quite entry and or introductory. Um, level war game, but of, of low to medium complexity. Um, yeah, I, I recommend um, getting it. Both battles play very differently. Uh, Gettysburg is classic Gettysburg, three, um, three day long engagement um, across a, a wide variety of terrain. 
and then you have um, Second Bull Run, which has got a little bit of a camp or a, a cam, um, operational flair to it. Um, you will do fighting on the day before, but it's really about positioning um, formations uh, so they can be effective uh, the coming uh, the coming days. But I think that's all I've got uh, to say and to share about uh, this design. So, um, as always, uh, thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll catch you guys on the next one.